Have you ever wondered what the right type of intermittent fasting is for you? Well, I'm here to help you with that decision. I'm Dr. Amy and welcome to another episode of Dr. Confidential, where I take you behind the scenes, I show you the science, I tell you what you should know about medicine and health and wellness beyond. So let's get into it. Today, we're gonna to be talking about intermittent fasting. What is the best type of intermittent fasting for you and how should you choose? So first, let me get into what are the different types of intermittent fasting so that you can kind of determine what might be right for you. So number one, I'd like to talk about time-restricted eating. This is often called time-restricted feeding in the medical literature. It's basically restricting the number of hours that you eat in a day. So for example, a time-restricted feeding schedule or time-restricted eating schedule could be from 12 to 7 p.m. So you start eating at 12 p.m. and you stop eating at 7 p.m. at night. This is very commonly used in medical studies and it can easily be applied to your life. So for example, you could do a nine to seven schedule where you start eating at nine and you stop eating at 7 p.m. Or you could do something like a one to five schedule, very restricted, only a four hour eating window, 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. Okay, so that's time restricted eating. Now, a second type of intermittent fasting is alternate day fasting. It's exactly what it sounds like. You eat normally one day and the next day you fast. You could either fast completely or in some regimens, they let you have a certain small amount of calories uh, around 500 or so. This alternate day fasting is also quite popular in the literature. Because of a lot, of, a lot of the studies around intermittent fasting are done on animals, it's very easy to do alternate day fasting studies because basically you feed the animal one day and then you don't feed the animal the next day. Alternate day fasting schedules are quite popular. And then we have the 16-8 schedule. The 16-8 regimen is probably the most common one you, that you've seen on the internet. 16 hours of fasting, with eight hours of eating. So this is something like what you might see is a 8 p.m. at night to a 12 p.m. fast, and then you eat from 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. again. So that's a 16-8 schedule, very common. Then we have the 5-2 diet. This is also quite popular because of a book that came out called The 5-2 Diet. It basically is five days of eating normally, and then you pick two non-consecutive days to fast. Um, and on those two days, you don't necessarily fast completely. You're allowed to have a certain number of calories um, on those two non-consecutive days. So those are the very typical styles of fasting. Uh, there's also the next type of fasting that I actually love and enjoy. It's called circadian fasting. This type of fasting is using circadian rhythms, which are the 24 hours day and night cycles that run our body to inform how you should fast. So here's how it goes. Our bodies know to turn off or turn down our digestive processes, our metabolic processes late in the evening. Around 8 p.m., our blood sugars start to rise and our ability to process foods goes down. That is a great time to start fasting. So circadian fasting means using the day, night, sun, and dark cycles to time your fast. So you might want to start fasting, say, around 8 p.m. And then you wake up in the morning and you eat again, maybe like 9 or 10 a.m. So you're getting a good 13, 14, 15 hour fast based on the day and night cycle. You could also start at sunset, you know, a little bit earlier, 6.30 or 7, and um, fast all the way to sunrise, and that might just be a 12 or 13 hour fast. So circadian fasting is based on circadian rhythm science. Circadian rhythm science has become more popular. And in 2017, the Nobel Prize in Medicine went to Jeffrey Hall and colleagues around circadian rhythms. The process of how circadian rhythms works on a molecular level was not really known until that time. We now know that there's a clock in every single one of our cells, and we really should be timing our day to match our circadian rhythms a little bit closer. That will improve our health, and in my opinion, that really will reduce the risk of disease for many people. We know that insulin levels, we know that cholesterol, blood pressure, all is 
in a circadian pattern. And so if we live and eat more closer to circadian rhythms, we can improve all of those things. Circadian rhythm science is really interesting. Now you know all of the different types of fasting. There's so many more. I just touched on a few. I wanted to get into some of the science behind inter intermittent fasting. The science behind intermittent fasting is extremely important and can help you decide what kind of fasting is right for you. Even though I'm a doctor, you should be working with your own personal doctor to determine if any of these types of fasting are right for you. It really depends on you, your medical medications, your past medical history, your preferences, your lifestyle, your food choices, etc. So let's get into the science. Now I told you about the 2017 Nobel Prize in Medicine, but let me tell you about the study that was published in uh, New England Journal of Medicine in 2019. This was Dr. Matson's commentary about intermittent fasting and the importance of intermittent fasting in disease. He especially talked about neurological disease because that is his field of expertise. What he argued in that study is that intermittent fasting is more than just calorie restriction. So let me explain to you. Many, many years, ever since I was in medical school, we knew that there was some evidence that calorie restriction in your diet can improve length of life. Many animal studies showed that reducing your calories about 25% can lengthen life. And this was seen in animal studies over and over and over again. When intermittent fasting became very popular as a diet, people kept saying, well, maybe it's just about calorie reduction because you know we know that there's many benefits beyond length of life, lengthening of life that happen with calorie reduction, like improved blood pressure, imp improved cholesterol, improved blood sugar balance, improved metabolism and weight loss. However, what Dr. Matson argued is that there is another more important process that is happening during intermittent fasting that is responsible for the benefits. He called this the metabolic switch. The metabolic switch is when our body switches from using glucose, its primary source of fuel, to using fatty acids as fuel. Now, when that switch happens, and then when you switch back to glucose, that going back and forth is the magic. And he argues that this is the magic behind intermittent fasting that turns on all of the downstream benefits of intermittent fasting. So it's like exercise. When we exercise, we are working our muscles and getting the benefits but then there's all these other brain and metabolism and longevity benefits that happen with exercise. Similarly, intermittent fasting has those benefits as well. And he thinks that the reason those happen is because of this metabolic switch. So you might be wondering, okay, Dr. Amy, how do I know if my body is making that metabolic switch? So that's a great question. We don't know, and we don't have the ability to know when our body's actually making a metabolic switch. But here's a way to think about it. When we are in the fed state, which is most of us right now, you know, watching this video, you are in the fed state. In the fed state, your body prefers to use glucose and you're using glucose as fuel. So unless you're fasting right now, or unless you're on a very low carbohydrate diet, you're using glucose as fuel. When you fast, when you intermittent fast, you still use glucose glucose for fuel for a few hours after you fast, if, after you start fasting. So if you start fasting at 7 p.m., you might still be using glucose for fuel until 10 p.m. or maybe even longer. Then your body goes to get the glycogen stores from your liver. And when it is done with the glycogen stores in your liver, that is when the metabolic switch happens. So you can imagine that that is different for everyone. If you had a big pasta dinner and you have a very high carbohydrate diet and you don't move a lot, you're not gonna get into that metabolic switch zone until much, much later. However, if you're very active or if you eat a pretty low, low carbohydrate or medium carbohydrate diet, or you haven't had a pasta dinner, then you're more likely to make that switch. And we think that switch is around, you know, between 12 and 16 hours for most people, 12 being the lowest end and 16 or even 18 being the higher end. So if you want to hack this, one of the things that I do is after my overnight fast, say I start fasting at 7 p.m. and then I wake up at 6.30 or 7, I go for a fasted workout. This ensures that your body needs more, you know, is looking for fuel. So it'll look again for glucose in your blood, it'll look for glycogen in your liver, and if it doesn't find any of those things, it makes that metabolic switch, 
the magic metabolic switch. And so this is a way for you to kind of hack intermittent fasting. Now, can you definitely know that you're in the metabolic switch zone? No, there's no test. There's no way to absolutely determine if you've made that switch. So this kind of theory is really interesting, but we don't really know exactly how to apply it just yet. Now I want to talk to you about another study that has even shorter intermittent fasting. So let me tell you about the Dr. Ruth Patterson study. This study can help you determine whether maybe even shorter intermittent fasting might be right for you. So if you're someone who struggles with even 16, eight, so 16 hours of fasting, this might be something you would be interested in. So Dr. Ruth Patterson took her patients, breast cancer survivors, and she broke them up into two groups. One group did not fast at all. They got the standard you know, dietary advice that uh, breast cancer survivors get. And then the other group was asked to fast in kind of a circadian pattern, but only 13 and a half hours every night. Her thought process behind this was that breast cancer survivors, these women, they've been through a lot. They're often frail. They've been through chemo or radiation or both and she didn't want them to fast for long periods of time. So she tried to pick the shortest interval she could think of. The group that fasted just 13 and a half hours every night had a drastic reduction in breast cancer recurrence. You will be shocked, but there was a 36% reduction in breast cancer recurrence in the group that was fasting 13 and a half hours a night on average. So what that told me, and I think that what told the world, is that even short intervals of overnight fasting can be very beneficial. And this makes sense. In hunter-gatherer societies, we know that they don't eat late at night. There's no drive-throughs, there's no Uber Eats, there's no microwaves. So you have to finish eating you know, at sunset or shortly after, and then you're not eating probably for about 13, 13 and a half, maybe even more, because you don't just roll out of bed in a hunter-gatherer society and like grab a Pop-Tart. You're going to go forage uh, or hunt or for food and then get together with your group of villagers um, or family members and eat together. So doing an overnight circadian fast, even in a shorter interval, can be beneficial and historically it makes sense. So I wanted to present the science to you so that you can choose the right type of intermittent fasting for you. Now, there are many, many other studies that I didn't even get to today that can help inform how you will fast or when you will fast. But these are some of the ones that I use to make my decision for doing overnight fasting. So for me, doing a overnight circadian style fast seems to be really great for my busy schedule. I end it with a fasted workout in order to get that metabolic switch. And then I pepper every month with one 24 hour dinner to dinner fast so that I can get into this other zone called autophagy, which seems to be turned up at the 18 to 24 hour mark. Now autophagy is something I didn't talk much about, but basically it's a cellular clean out of the cell. And this happens with longer durations of fasting. We're always doing a little bit of autophagy all the time, but when we approach that 18 to 24 mark, the level of autophagy really goes up and our body can experience a big cellular clean out. So that might be something that's of interest to you to do once in a while, or maybe even more regularly, depending on you and your preferences. So that's it. I hope that this information was able to provide you some more clarity around what type of intermittent fasting is right for you. Now, remember to watch my other videos about intermittent fasting, about gut health, the behind the scenes, and all of the other videos I have here. I hope that you'll join me next time on Dr. Confidential. I'm Dr. Amy. Thanks so much.